Buonasera signore e signori e benvenuti, welcome to the Italian table, food, stories and traditions with special guest Marianne Esposito. I am Chiara Durazzini and I am the event coordinator at I am Books. I am Books is an independent bookstore and cultural hub specialized in Italian and Italian American literature. We are located in the heart of the North End in Boston and we reopened our physical store just a few weeks ago. So if you are in the area, please come and visit. This event is the kickoff to the virtual series Our Voyage, Italian American Stories, that we are organizing in partnership with NIAF, National Italian American Foundation. NIAF sent me a welcoming video that I will share with you right now. Buonasera a tutti. My name is Julia Streisfeld Kennedy, and I am the Director of Scholarships, Grants, and Youth Engagement at the National Italian American Foundation. Thank you for joining us for our voyage, Italian American Stories, brought to you by I Am Books. NIAF is a membership based, nonpartisan, and nonprofit organization. Founded in 1975, NIAF's mission is to preserve the Italian American heritage and culture promote and inspire a positive image and legacy of Italian Americans, and strengthen and empower ties between the United States and Italy. Since its founding, NIAF has contributed tens of millions of dollars towards educational and cultural initiatives like tonight's event that contributes to the collective well-being of our Italian American community. We simply could not succeed in our efforts without our members' support. So please consider visiting our website, www.niaf.org, to learn more about our programs, become a member, or make a donation. Based in Washington, D.C., we are very excited to sponsor tonight's virtual event with such a unique cultural hub that so closely shares our mission. On behalf of the National Italian American Foundation, I would like to thank I Am Books for the vital role you play in keeping our language, culture, and heritage alive, and to you, the viewers, for joining us this evening. Grazie e buona serata. Hey, grazie, grazie, Nayaf. Thank you so much, Nayaf. So, I think that we couldn't choose a better, a better way to open this series than talking about food and what food, Italian food, the cibo italiano. And with a wonderful expert, Master Chef Marianne Esposito, who has brought us joy and a lot of acquolina in bocca <laughs> with her TV program Ciao Italia on PBS for 30 years, 30 anni, incredibile. She has taught millions of fans how to cook delicious, authentic Italian dishes. She is the author of 13 books on the art of regional Italian cooking. And here with me, I have one of those books, the bestseller Ciao Italia, My Lifelong Adventures in Italy. And she is currently working on her new book that will come out in the fall. Now, I want to point out that you attendees to this webinar uh, can have a discount of 10% to this book when you will buy it on our website. Now, in the chat later on throughout the event, I will write the link to the book and the code. You must have a code for the discount. Now, with no further ado, andiamo a incominciare. Benvenuta, Mary Ann. Benvenuta. Uh, grazie e buonasera a tutti. Thank you Now, Mary Ann, we titled this event food stories and traditions. Let's start from the end. Let's start from the traditions. 
because I would like to know, and, and audience, if you have questions for Marianne, please write them in the chat or in the Q&A whenever you want throughout the event. But my question to Marianne is about her own traditions. Uh, whether these traditions of maybe your family, your childhood, have anything to do with your career today? Well, they have everything to do with my career today because I grew up in a Italian American home with two nonnas, one who was from Sicily, the center of Sicily, actually in Caltanissetta. And she was a butcher by profession, which is very unusual for women at, at that time. And my other grandmother was Neapolitan. So I am a true Southern Italian. And having two grandmothers living with you meant that when you were indoors, you were in Italy. But the minute you stepped outside, you were in America. So there was the blending of living with the two Nonas, experiencing their traditions and their cooking, which was, of course, passed on to me, and then living a life as a child who wanted to be American and with her American friends. So just to give you an example, when I would go to school, my Nona Galasso, who was Neapolitan, would make my lunch every day. And my lunch consisted of coarse bread with a frittata dentro. And when I got to school and had to open my lunch bag, everybody else was having peanut butter and jelly on white bread, and I was having the pane con frittata. So I wanted to be like them, not what my nonas were, were giving me. So I had to struggle with that dual kind of identity of being Italian at home, but being an American kid once I walked outside the door. But the, what I learned over the years, and it didn't come to me until when I was much later, I really didn't appreciate that heritage that I had, that Southern Italian heritage that I had, because it wasn't until I really made my first trip to Italy, which was in, somewhere around 1985 or 86, that I realized that what my grandmothers had said about the old country was true. It was beautiful. The people were wonderful. The food was delicious. The art and the architecture were spectacular. And it was like a light bulb went on in my head. And I thought, wow, I have this great heritage and I really should embrace it. And that's when I started Ciao Italia. <laughs> Wow, wow. And no, I can imagine we have already a comment from Eleonora who is saying, uh, my kids are the same. We cook Italian and they prefer the food from the school cafeteria. Oh. Okay, peccato. Okay, peccato. But I'm pretty sure that it will come a time yes. pretty shortly, yeah, wow. I think, in which they will appreciate it, right? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, my my nonas, they were they were business women in their own right, in the sense that my grandmother had that butcher store, uh, and my, and the Neapolitan grandmother ran a boarding house. So they were cooking all the time. And my mother was at age fifty; she became a dietitian. So now, you know, food was was always central. We were always doing something. We were either making bread or pasta or stinging feathers off of chickens. You know, there was a lot, a lot of work involved in those households. And I grew to resent that as a, as a kid. I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to be singeing feathers off of chickens. I wanted to be out riding my bike with the other kids and all of that. And so I, I really did not enjoy being involved in the food world at that point. It wasn't until I made that first trip to Italy and I realized, you know, wow, this is what they've given me. This is the heritage that they've passed on that I began to realize, hey, you know, wake up and smell what you have here. You have a rich tradition of uh, two Italian grandmothers who have given you so much information about the Italy that they knew. And my mother too, because I now I have all of my mother's old recipe books, so to speak, 
Because, you know, when people ask me about recipes, Kara, I have to say, you know, Italian women never cooked from recipes. No, no. They cooked from what was up here and what they had on hand. What was here? A little bit of this, a little bit of that became something. And I always like to bring up the recipe that people ask me for. Well, how do you make uh, uh, maltagliati? Maltagliati, badly cut pasta. I said, well, maltagliati comes from the fact that when women made pasta, they often had little scraps that were left over. You know, they had dried out a little bit. And so they would cut them in random pieces, no shape or form, and they'd throw them in the soup pot. And this is how you come to maltagliati. But for women having recipes at that time, no, no. They cooked from intuition. That is absolutely true. In fact, I have to say that I usually use uh, books. I like to look at them to yeah. have new ideas, mm -hmm. to have new ideas yeah. very often because I feel that I repeat myself a lot and I cook all the time. Uh, yeah. So sometimes I like, oh, oh my gosh, what am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to make tomorrow? And yeah. here we go that I consult a book and I say, oh yeah. And you know how many times looking at this book, I was like, oh yeah, I remember I used to do that and I forgot about it, mm -hmm. right? And it's yeah. always also fun for me to kind of uh, co compare how I make it or how you make, make yes. it. So yes. I think it's always, you know, the field is so much fun, right? Yeah. And I think the best food comes from just doing it you know, naturally, not following a recipe. Well, naturally, I've written 13 cookbooks, but and those all follow a formula. But that's for people who need a guide. You know, they need, they, not everyone yeah. can just pull something out of the refrigerator right. and yeah. make something. So well, cookbooks are a guide, but like you said, you can always deviate from them. You don't like oregano, you can use something else. Yeah. So they're just guides. Yes, I agree. Okay, we have a question from Cindy that is asking, how long did you live in Buffalo, New York? And when <laughs> you, did you leave? Because she's from New York, Italian heritage okay. as well. Well, you know, I, I grew up, I was born in Buffalo and I lived in Buffalo until I was 23. I went to Rochester, New York, which is which was the actually ancestral home of my grandmother, my Sicilian grandmother, who immigrated to Rochester because my grandfather, Rosario, who, who worked on the railroads, had, got, had a job there. So they lived in Rochester. So Buffalo, Rochester is very familiar uh, to me, Western New York. And believe me, there are some wonderful, wonderful Italian ethnic neighborhoods in Buffalo and Rochester, New York. So it, it, it was, it, you know, that brought back great memories, the woman who just, who just called in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, uh, you sent me a very, very nice slideshow in order for me to share it with the audience uh, and show about your traveling in Italy. So it's, it's, it's in between a couple of, there are a couple of, of recipes I saw mm -hmm. and some photos of Italian places and Italian ingredients. I, I, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that because in the meantime, I'm gonna begin to share the the the, the PowerPoint. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so and this, I think, it's about your. Um, uh, your uh, uh, traveling and probably researching? Yes, because I, when I started traveling in Italy, that was in the early 80s, mm -hmm. um, I began to realize that going from region to region, mm -hmm. the food is very different. Uh. And so when I did my show, the very first show that I did, I said, I stood in front of a map exactly like that. Yes. And I said right into the camera, there is no such thing as Italian food. There is only regional food. There's, you just cannot make a blanket statement saying this is Italian food. No, you have to say regional Italian because there are 20 regions of Italy, as you well know. Mm -hmm. And each one of these regions 
cooks differently. True. And why do they cook differently? They cook differently because of a number of factors. Number one, when you look at the map of Italy, you see that it is a peninsula and it has a spine of mountains going right down the center. So geography and location determines what the food will be in those regions. To give you a perfect example, I said that half of my family comes from around Naples, a little town uh, near Avalino. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the region of Campania on the map, which includes Naples and the Amalfi Coast, you notice that here you have very rich soil, a warm climate. And so there are certain products that grow very, very well here that will not grow well, let's say in the Piedmont or Friuli Venezia Giulia, like tomatoes. Let's use tomatoes as an example because everybody loves them. So tomatoes grow in volcanic soil. And at Mount Vesuvius at the base, you have a particular type of tomato that grows there, which is the San Marzano. Yeah. So people always say to me, well, I grow San Marzano in my garden or I, I buy San Marzano. And I say to them, no, no, you don't. You buy plum tomatoes. You don't buy San Marzano because the only place you would be able to buy San Marzano is in San Marzano. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on because yeah. we have a visual of the uh, DOP, San Marzano tomatoes. But geography, location determines what the food will be in these regions. That's mm -hmm. what we have. Mm -hmm. Now, Diana is asking which region of Italy is your favorite and why? I know. Well, this is like asking which child do I like best? <laughs> right? <laughs> I have exactly. I, I have traveled in all of these regions. Uh, and, you know, because my family comes from Naples and they come from Caltanissetta in Sicily, these are very uh, important and close to the chest regions yeah. that I like. But I love all of Italy. There is nothing to dislike about any of these regions. Oh. They all bring something very special. Yeah. So I enc encourage people to travel. So that's why I wanted to put this map up to show people that there is no such thing as Italian food. There's only regional Italian. And the other way I like to explain it is to say, you know, if you were, to if you were in Georgia, you would want to eat what Georgia is noted for. Now, the first thing I would think of is like peach pie or barbecue, <laughs> right? I wouldn't order that in Boston because that's not typical of Bostonian food. In Boston, I want to have baked beans and lobster and <laughs> seafood because that's what the region is known right. for. Well, you use that same analogy for the regional differences in the, in the 20 regions of Italy. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, I'm from Tuscany. Uh, yeah. We, I mean, there's 30, 40 minutes of train to go to Bologna, I studied in Bologna, and the food is completely different. different. And of course, there are the Appennini that separate the That's two right. seas, right? But That's but right. they are so close to each other that it's crazy how the food is different. It's amazing. Very different. Yeah. And you have to remember that years and years ago, before travel was even possible, mm -hmm. the geography of Italy, because of the, the difficulty of, of the mountain regions, prevented people from going from region to region. Yeah. So pretty much they were pretty much insulated in their own area. Right. And yeah. that's what helped to preserve a lot of those traditional foods. Yes. And here we are in Sicily, I see. Yes. Uh, next slide. Roma. Al Pantheon, we can see you <laughs> okay. among all the tourists. I can't see the next slide, but the next slide, which one are you on? Did you see it? The Roma? Roma? I see the, I only see the map. Huh. Yeah. That is strange. Okay, so just a second. Because for me, it's going, but hmm. how about now? No. But we can talk about them without me seeing them. Does everybody no. else see them? Yeah. Uh, no, but I can. Uh, I can just do the um, the the regular 
uh, this one. There you go. Okay, that's the second one. Now we're in Rome. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, that's that's strange that it's not sharing the slideshow. I don't understand yeah. why. Well, the reason I put this slide here is because, you know, most people say to me, well, I'm going to Italy for the first time. Where should I go? Where should I go? And of course, most people want to go to the big three that I, I call the big three. They mm -hmm. want to go to Rome, the cradle, of course. Right. They want to go to Venice, Venice. And they mm -hmm. want to go to Firenze, where you are from. They want to go to Florence. The big A story. lot. <laughs> yeah. And that's all great and wonderful. And I love Rome. And every time I go, of course, it's like I'm there the first time. But what I'm trying to say is once you get out of those big threes, those big cities, and you venture into the smaller little towns, that's where you're going to find more of the authentic foods more of the foods that are not for tourists, if you know what I mean, you know. Yes, I always yes. say, when you're in big cities like Rome, you don't want to eat the tourist menu. You mm -hmm. want to eat what Romans eat. What do Romans like to eat? They like to eat what? They like to eat amatriciana, right? Amatriciana. Yeah. yeah. They like to eat uh, roast lamb, right? They mm -hmm. like to eat um, roasted um, artichokes. And one of the best places to have them is in a restaurant in Rome, which is called, it's in the Jewish uh, area, actually, it's called Piperno. And they make these wonderful artichokes. And I'm thinking artichokes because spring is coming. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is get out of the big cities. Yes, go there and absorb as much as you can. But then go to some of the smaller towns surrounding these cities, because that's where you're going to find more authentic food. And here we go to Amalfi, to uh, the yes. Capri. Everybody, everybody wants to go uh, to Capri, to Capri. They want to go to Capri. Yes. So, uh, yes, because it's, it's so crowded in the summer. Uh, uh, it, it's so crowded, but it's so romantic. And, and <laughs> yeah, that so, is true. It, and, and the Matera. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the opposite of a yeah. place like Capri because how many people go to Basilicata, a region mm -hmm. in the way south of Italy? How many people actually go to this region? They've never even heard of it, maybe. And here you have Matera, which mm -hmm. is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this is the land of the Sassi. The Sassi are the caves that a lot of people lived in in the 40s and 50s before the Italian government decided we're going to close these up because it's not safe for people to live in these in these caves and many times they were just I've been there they've been just hewn out of the the side of the rocks and families would be crowded into one room with everything there'd be, there'd be the uh, you know the, the weaving loom the cow would be over here, the chickens over here, and the bed over there. Everybody lived in, in that one space. Yeah. So, but today, those sassi have mm -hmm. been turned into boutique hotels, restaurants. And yeah. it's a fascinating place uh, to visit. So I like to show this slide because I want people to realize that there's so much more to Italy than just Rome, Venice, and Tuscany. Well, there is my friend uh, uh, Scott online who says I go all the time. He does oh, go. Good yeah, he does go. Good. He does go. Uh, and then we have ah yes, ah la madre patria. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, it, as many times as I've been to Florence. I have to say that again, it's like I've gone for the first time because your your uh, your eyes, your your brain cannot possibly capture what this all means because you have to take yourself out of your mindset. You are a 21st century person looking at something that was made without the use of modern machinery. And you have to say to yourself, how is this possible? How... What it says to me is the genius of man when he is doing good. This is the genius of man. 
when you yes. look at this. Of Brunelleschi. Yeah. Uh, Brunelleschi, absolutely. Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi's dome. Now, Brunelleschi. let me ask you, what is your favorite, that's my question, what is your favorite food that we eat in Florence, in Firenze? In Florence? Yeah, what, oh. if you were now in Florence, what would you choose to eat? Well, I would really choose the Papa al Pomodoro because uh -huh. I absolutely love that. That is a classic dish. Yes. It's a it's a very what do I want to say pulpy, thick tomato soup that is made with bread mm -hmm. uh, and and tomatoes. But of course, I also love a stew made with cingale. So cingale, uh -huh. is, cingale, yes, cingale. Yes. Is wild boar done with you know herbs and spices and red wine, absolutely delicious. Yes. And if I'm going to Nanini's, uh -huh. uh, a Siena, <laughs> in Siena. A Siena, I'm going to have Panforte uh -huh. because I love that spiced cake so much. And yeah. Uh, yeah, things like that. Those are those are things that I really really enjoy. So John is asking, Marianne, what is your favorite Italian soup or stew to make and or eat? Well, actually, you know what? Another Tuscan one comes to mind, a stew that's called peposo. Do you know peposo? Ah. Oh. Yeah, peposo, yeah, which it's is pepper. So, it's so flavorful, right? Oh, right, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a meat stew and, it's, and it, it comes from, uh, the word peposo means peppery, it's come from pepper, pepe, pepe. So that's that's one of my favorites. I, I love that. That's that's an absolute favorite. I, mean, this I time agree. Year, I agree. I agree. Okay, let's go forward with uh, Pompeii. Pompeii. Pompeii is one of my favorite places to visit because you know what? I learn about food there. That's why I threw this slide up. In mm -hmm. Pompeii, you can learn an awful lot about what these people were eating. Now, just recently, when I was in Pompeii, and I don't have a slide of it, they, I saw a mm -hmm. loaf of bread, a round loaf of bread with a stamp. The stamp mark was still on the top of it. And it was scored into eight, eight pieces. It was into eight wedges. And it reminded me that when people made bread, in Rome or Pompeii, they made a coarse bread, a bread that came from, you know, really coarse ground uh, uh, cereal, cereal grains. And in order for someone who was going to make bread to know that their bread was going to be baked in a communal oven, because not everybody had an oven, they had to somehow identify the bread. And so they put some sort of a mark on it you know, an X or a stamp, something, so that when that bread came out of the oven, you knew that that was your loaf to take home. I, I found that to be fascinating. So they did find, we did find charred looking bread from, you know, Vesuvius. So yeah. this is, this was fascinating. And also when you walk through the streets of Pompeii, you see a lot of these beautiful mur murals on the walls in some of the villas, but also you walk along the streets and you see the Romans were really ahead of their time with fast food because there were fast food stations yes. where you could, just like today, you know, you, you're in a hurry, you need to buy, get fast food. Well, you could go to a fast food station right there in ancient Rome and get something to eat. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I read an article that uh, scientists analyzed the yes. just recently the leftovers of, yes. of the fast food, the, the Pompeian yes. fast food, and they were able to determine what they were eating. But they no, were I don't remember it, but yeah, that's amazing. Fried now, we are going to morning. Siena. Now we are going to Siena. <laughs> We are going to Siena because one of the things that I, I like to bring to my audience is to teach them not just about the food, but also about the culture of Italy. Because Italy to me is probably the best gift the world ever has had in terms of what they have given us in art, architecture, music. I always say when you think about the greatest achievements in Western civilization, the people who made those, who, who were behind those achievements, their names ended in A, I, O, and U. 
they were Italians. Mm -hmm. You know, you think they went from artists to scientists. And so whenever I'm in Italy, I take my camera crew with me and we talk about some of the art. And we're not just talking about the food. So this is the maestà. And this is the maestà. And, and then we, we have uh, the Allegoria del Cattivo Governo. Right. This, this <laughs> has always captivated me because it's a very good lesson on where we are today, right? Uh, this uh, is timely today as it was then. So this is this is a, a depiction of uh, by Lauren and Zetti of bad government when everything's falling apart and you don't have good leaders, you have you have a breakdown in society, you don't you have famine, you have disease, yeah, yeah, you have destruction. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, next slide. That's bad government. Yes, and then we have and then we have good government. We have il bono governo, mm -hmm. where when we have an organized society, we have good rulers. Uh, we have we have uh, we have citizens who play by the rules. We have we have prosperity, right? We have right. we we are in good health. Everybody's at peace, and life goes on as it should. So I think that's a very good message. So we're always trying to bring in, you know, some of the, the culture. That's, that's awesome. And here we go back to Italy with the Opera <laughs> dei Pupi. Huh? Yes. What, one of the things that I insist on when I take my groups to Italy, and I've done this now for 19 years, is that we are going to experience some of the culture. And so this is Sicily. And um, I've always been fascinated by the puppet shows, the Opera dei Pupi. And in Palermo today, there are only three, three uh, puppeteers left, which makes me sad because these puppets are absolutely gorgeous. They're as tall as I am and yeah. they're beautifully costumed. Yeah. And the idea was, you know, to tell the story of, of, of good versus evil. And mm -hmm. so, the stories revolve around these puppets on stage that are beautifully costumed and they're, you know, the Christians are fighting the Saracens and they're knocking their heads off and they're, yeah, yeah. they're uh, rescuing the damsel who's in distress. They're a wonderful part of Sicilian life that I hate to see disappear. And so when, I I, when I'm in Sicily, I always take my, my, uh, my uh, group to a puppet show so that they can experience this. Very good. Now, Caroline is asking, other than your family, who, who, who would you love to cook for and what would you make? How about you, Chiara? Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. I would oh, love my. that. I would yes. love that. I, Come, would make, I, would, I would make uh, uh, lasagna di carnevale because we're almost in Lent. Yeah. Perfetto. I'm happy, super happy with that. A typical uh, Neapolitan dish. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, now let's see some good food, some good ingredients, right? Yes, yes. For example, yes. fruttivendolo with yeah. very good. No, I, I yeah. see. I see that this is Sicily because yeah. talking about this reg regionalism. Yeah. I if you if you did the right fruttivendolo Palermo Sicily, I would have I would have guessed that is from Sicily. Why? Who knows why? Let's see if if our participants can guess, or you, Marianne, guess how would I know that this is a, a fruttivendolo in Sicily and not in a northern part of Italy? I want to see. Uh -huh. Ah, Jolie, ah, Jolie wrote Fiki d'India. Yes, and she Fiki guessed Dindia. it right. And, and she's right. And she is absolutely right. I well, mean, I would <laughs> never see Fiki d'India any, anywhere else. Yeah. They're, they're, well, when you travel around uh, Palermo, you see them everywhere. There's farms of these. They're just farms of them. Fiki d'India. But the reason I put this slide here is because I think you can learn a lot about the people and the culture of where you are by visiting a market, by visiting a market, because there you're not only seeing what the, what the products are of the area, but you're watching what people buy. You're listening to them talk to the fruit of Vendolo, and you learn, as I did, 
-hmm. not to touch the products. They're big sign, non toccare. Non toccare means don't <laughs> touch. Don't touch. And I thought, wow, well, why is that? Well, I learned very early on why that is. Number one, the, these products are very fresh. They're very fresh. So you handle them. Everybody's handling them. You know, they get all mushy. You know. Secondly, the, the fruit, the vendor will say to you, what do you want? So then you tell this person. But here's the beauty of this. They want to know the full story. So one day when I was in the market, I wanted to buy some, not in Sicily, but in um, Perugia, I wanted to buy some pears because I had Italian friends that I was going to make a, a torta di pere for. So I, I, so I started to pick the pear and I got, oh, non toccare. Non toccare. Eh. Non toccare. <laughs> the woman came over and she said, what do you want? And I said, well, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to buy some pears. She said, well, what are you going to do with the pears? And I, I so explained to her, I said, well, I want to make a tart with pears. She said, we don't want this pear. This pear is too soft. You want this pear because this pear is harder and it will hold up in baking better. You know what that said to me? How many times have I ever gone into an, uh, an American grocery store and someone paid attention to the pears or the apples or whatever it is I was buying. Nobody. But in Italy, this is what you get. This personal connection mm. between you, the food, and the fruit, the vendolo. So I think that's a very <laughs> that good That is thing. true. That is true. Uh, so somebody is correcting me that the Fiki di India, you can also find them in Calabria. And you're right. Yes, it's that's right. Time. That's true. Yes. That is true. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion, for the correction. Ah, this in Tuscany, we do have a lot. <laughs> yes. Well, it, most of Italy can grow uh, olive trees and there are many, many cultivars. There's so many kinds of mm -hmm. olives, but Puglia at the heel of Italy, yeah. it's really yeah. the, uh, the top producer. And um, this is a product, the PDO Colline Salernitane? This, this is, is, a this is a, uh, a, a, an olive oil. Yes, I was just trying to explain here that you don't want to get, you don't want to get gypped. So you want to make sure you're buying an authentic thing. So if you look for the European seal, that yellow seal down there, mm -hmm, the bottom, mm -hmm. that tells you that this is a product that is co actually coming from Italy and was produced in Italy because there's so much fake stuff out it's there. It's true. A well, lot comes from Spain. A lot yeah, comes yeah. from, uh, yeah. you know, Morocco. So yeah, it's it's hard to find a real Italian uh, yeah. olive oil. And you want to you want to look for the do. P mm -hmm. on a lot of these olive oils, which will tell you that that is, a, that is an olive oil that's coming maybe from a single cultivar, maybe one olive, and it is produced under conditions that are designated by the consortio. A consortio yeah. is a governing body yeah. That, yeah. That, that puts out rules how this can be made. So to answer somebody's question that they're going to ask, like, what is extra virgin olive oil? You have to answer it this way. Extra virgin olive oil means that the olives have come from the very first pressing, first pressing of the olives. Secondly, by law, it, can it must contain less than 1% acidity. And third, no external mechanical heat has been used to help extract the oil because heat is the enemy of olive oil as well as light. And that's why you always buy olive oil in dark bottles yeah because light is is something that will ruin uh olive oil over time so you've got to be really really conscious of what you're buying by reading the label yeah and yeah. there are many and this in fact we have a ne next yeah uh, label of yeah. the same uh, yeah so model this, mm -hmm. yeah so this mm -hmm. is telling you where this yeah. is coming from where yes. it says designation of origin you see that the hills yeah. of the salentina the salentina mm -hmm. So yes. that tells you that that is a true product of Italy. Right, right. Exactly. Now let's see the famous tomatoes. <laughs> the yes. plum tomatoes, right? Now, these are plum tomatoes that I grew in my garden this year. <laughs> the, the, these are called redorta. Redorta. They're a ritorta, plum. ritorta. Red, yeah, red, meaning. Redorta. Uh -huh. And it's a, it's a pulpy, pulpy tomato. It's heavy in the hand uh -huh. and it's, it's good for making sauce, but this is not a San Marzano. 
It's right. A, every plum tomato is not a San Marzano. Right. San, yeah. San so, Marzano is the OP, the origine Marzano, protetta. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to get these is canned. So you can, you can get San Marzano, but they will be canned. And mm -hmm. on it, it will say San Marzano D-O-P, Denominazione Origine Protetta, right? Yeah. So it yep. tells you that the tomatoes, San Marzano, were grown in San Marzano, and they were produced under rules under a consortial. Now, these yep. tomatoes are always, if you buy them canned, they're always whole. They are never, ever diced, cut up. Mm -hmm. They're whole. Mm -hmm. They have a very sweet flavor. They have very few seeds, and they're ideal for making a uh, tomato sauce. So yeah. you can buy San Marzano D.O.P. in scatola, solo in scatola. Right, Means exactly. And here, what do we have? We have more tomatoes. These, Ooh. now, this is a tomato that I just experimented with. Someone sent me these seeds. These are the Pienolo, Pienolo del mm -hmm. Vesuvio. So this is like a cherry, it's a bigger than a cherry tomato. It has a pointed end. And these are the tomatoes that you see strung up, you know, in the markets. The, right. Kind of dry them so that they can have them in mm -hmm. the, in the uh, colder months of the year. And uh, this is absolutely a fantastic tomato. And um, I'm hoping to grow it again this year. Yum. Now let's take a little break with the recipe. Oh. That is... Uh, in, I think that our friends will be happy to see a, a, a wonderful cake that yeah. is in your book, Ciao Italia, My Lifelong Food Adventures in Italy. This you can find it here, right? Yeah. Um, and it's a delicious torta mimosa. Mm? Yes, but why is it in the book? It's, it's called, it's a torta mimosa because mimosa is a yellow flower that grows in Italy that is given to women on Mother's Day. And so this torta mimosa. On the Festa della Donna. La Women's Festa Day. della Donna. Yes. Yeah. So this cake is made for La Festa della Donna. And it's called the mimosa cake because of the flower. And I included it in the book because I did some research about this. And I wanted, I want my books to reflect these traditional recipes that are going to be lost eventually they will be lost because the younger generation is not doing this. They, they're not home like the, the, the madre, the zia. They don't have the time. They're yeah. working. So they, you know, so I wanted to capture this and keep this alive, this, this cake, which I think is so uh, important and so um, reflective of uh, the, the, you know, Mother's Day. So that's why it's in the book. Right. I agree. And this is the whole recipe that now we don't have time, but you know, yeah. it's, yeah. it's uh, in the book. It's, it's actually easy to make. It looks like it's... it's yeah, it seems complicated, that. but uh, I, I, you know, I, I read it and uh, you need to be to have all these ingredients, but then it's quite easy. It's very... Right? Yeah. 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 Pasta fresca that we were yeah. talking about, about the maltagliati. Huh? Now this is all. This is pasta that I make uh, at home, and uh, I. Uh, this one of the things that I really like to make is pasta. So people ask me, "Well, what is your favorite thing to make?" Well, my favorite thing to make is is pasta. So mm. here we have the the vermicelli and uh, the fettuccine, but we make a, a lot of other different types of pasta. Wow, that's amazing! Uh, oh, and here we have cheeses: Asiago, still D.O.P. Yeah, and yeah. Parmigiano Reggiano. DOP. It's, it's really important to look for that DOP uh, designation because there are so many fake cheeses out there. Oh, like, oh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, there are also the Parmigiano made in you in the U.S. Uh, yeah, well, no, 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 no. No, this is the real cheese. I Parmigiano know. I know. <laughs> so I mean. this cheese, and then you have Sorry. products. So this is another DOP product, which is the aceto balsamico tradizionale, which can only come from uh, Reggio or Modena. Modena. These, mm -hmm. Yeah, these are the two examples. And you recognize them by the shape of the bottle. The one on the left is from Reggio, and the one on my right, the more squat bottle, is from Modena. 
Uh -huh. So this is a, a, a condimento, condimento yeah, that yeah. comes from cooked grape must and is aged for minimum 12 years, minimum 12 years. Now, when you buy these, these are not cheap. They start, well, they used to start at around $125 because there's for the, uh, for the Reggio Emilia one on the left, that's the gold label. So that, uh, I mean, that's the, yeah, that's the gold label. So that's the most expensive one, but the cheapest one is the Aragosta, which will have a red label. And then the second one would be the um, Argento, which is the silver label. So yeah. these, these are condimented. These, you just don't pour this on your salad. This is something you drizzle over uh, yeah, piece of yeah, cooked meat yeah. or fish or over fruit or ice cream, or you you add a few drizzles to your Parmigiano Reggiano because that comes from the same region of Emilia Romagna. These are classic. And classic. yeah, and let's clarify that it's Reggio Emilia, no Reggio Calabria. No, no, Emilia Reggio Romagna. Emilia. Reggio Emilia. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, then we have ah, oh, Pellegrini, yes. the Bible, the Bible. This is, this is the Bible because you remember early on I said women didn't cook from recipes; they cook from what they had. Well. Pellegrino Artuzzi, who was from Tuscany, actually, uh, was the first person to kind of collect and put together in book form recipes that he thought were important from the regions of Italy. So he codified, so to speak, the regional cooking of Italy, and he put it in this book, and this is the Bible. Yes, this is the yes. Bible. So if you're into Italian cooking, besides using my books, you may want to get a copy of this book as well. <laughs> yeah, that is very traditional for us. Yes, eh? yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And here, oh, how nice. We well, can... here, we, here we are. Every year I take a group to Italy. Of course, the last two years I have not been able to do that because of uh, the COVID. But I am going this year. I have two groups going. And this is me in a cooking school in Pellegr at, at Forlimpopoli, which is where um, Pellegrino Artuzzi's school is located. So here we are with students from the US working in the kitchen. Now, somebody's asking what year is uh, was the book written? I, I, I oh. want to guess the late 1800s. Yeah, it was, yes, I think that's right. I don't know the exact date, but it was. No, I don't know either, but I think it's kind of late 1800s. Yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Wow, this is fabulous. And here we have, and ah, we the, have the PBS program. A PBS program where we bring people on to uh, help us uh, with different you know, recipes, get them involved in the uh, regionality of Italian cooking. And uh, as I said, this is now our, will be, will be our 31st year of Italian regional cooking. My goodness, my goodness. So when is it going to air? Our series airs beginning in the spring. You'll have to check your local station or you can watch it on Create TV, Amazon Prime. Uh, you can watch it on Hungry TV, on YouTube. There's a bunch of places, but mainly uh, it lives on PBS Create TV. And uh, on our website, we you will find recipes from the 30 years, which is, I don't know, it's like 3,500 3, recipes and 1,500 oh. videos. It's a big body of work. It's a right. big body. Oh my gosh, body. an amazing collection. Now, may I ask who are those handsome men next to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, these, I, you know, I don't even really remember who they are. Because ah, okay. You know, I thought it was your maybe husband and son. No, 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 no. They were, they were just, they were visitors on the set ah, that day. Ah, ah, so okay. I can't remember exactly who they were. Okay. Because okay that's fabulous and here we have uh yeah. this book one of those 13 right yes. yes and next to it there's the cover of the, of your upcom upcoming book that i have to admit i'm very interested in because plant harvest cook is yeah. what i love to do to plant something in the vegetable garden in the summer and then and yeah. then pick some products. Of course, in Massachusetts, we are not, you know, uh, the best climate, but it's not Italy, but uh, it's very, it's interesting. Tell us a little bit about this new book. Well, I wrote this book during the pandemic. That's how I consoled myself about not being able to go to Italy because every year 
from uh, on our series, we showcase two segments from my home garden, which is planted by Gaetano, my husband. Mm -hmm. And we pretty much have all Italian uh, varietals in our garden. So this book uh, takes the reader from how to plant to how to harvest and how to cook the vegetables Italian style. So even if you don't have a garden, you can use this book because there's over 100 recipes in here. And I tell you, you know, this book uh, is, is so, um, it parallels what happens in Italy because so many people have gardens in Italy, but if you live in a city, you don't have a garden, but you do have a container. And if you look up in the balconies of the cities of in Italy, what do they have? They've got tomatoes growing, they've got basil growing, they've got their herbs all in a confined spot. So even if you don't have a piece of land, you could still do some pot, uh, uh, you know, planting and, and harvesting. And still, uh, it, it's a book that is it just kind of gives you simple, simple instructions for planting and but the recipes are for everybody. So sounds this fabulous. Call. Sounds yeah. fabulous. And here we have a little preview of one recipe that will appear in your yeah. next book. Eggplant yes. stuffed with sausage and couscous. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Because uh, eggplant are, you know, so dear to the heart of many Southern Italians. Yeah. So here's a, a, a way to use it and to uh, stuff it with couscous, which is something that you would find uh, in a lot of Sicilian cooking. And uh, so, yeah, I try to use the vegetables from the garden to give you some new and innovative ways to use them. That is awesome. And here, in fact, we have the, the way to make it. Now, I, I, I wonder whether you salt the eggplants or you don't need it. What do you think? I usually now, salt them. Yeah, well, there is the question. Because if they're small, if, if the eggplants are small, you don't have to do that because there are not a lot of seeds. And the seeds is where that bitterness comes from. Ah, if I didn't know. Yeah. If they're large, I would salt them and weight them down and then rinse them off and use them. Yeah. Mm, okay. This, I didn't know that it was around the seeds. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, I think we have another question, but I've been, I've been uh, passing to you all the questions that I see. Uh, one is uh, um, about gluten-free. And nowadays, my dear Marianne, yeah. we have a lot of uh, sensitive gluten sensitive people. So Carol is asking, missing, is saying actually, missing real pasta as I am gluten sensitive. Is yeah. there one region of Italy that you find more gluten sensitive people? And my question also is, uh, what, 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 what can we do about, I mean, for, if you want pasta, what can be a good substitution perhaps? Well, you know, I asked this question when I was in Italy from friends of mine who have a pasta company in um, uh, near um, uh, Verona, and they don't make pasta for gluten insensitive individuals, but out of Italy now are coming pastas that are for gluten sensitive individuals. So I don't make it myself, but I would think that you could use a rice pasta, mm -hmm. uh, a rice-based pasta. Um, I'm not sure about a buckwheat pasta, but I did make buckwheat pasta. Uh, so I'm, I'm not the one to ask about the gluten-free because I'm really, you know, I, I don't concentrate on that so of much. Of course, yes. But I, but I sympathize with people who can't, you know, have a regular pasta. But there are some good brands, I understand, that are coming out of Italy. Yeah, and in fact, uh, um, my friend actually, Sharon here, says that Jovial is her favorite brand, if we want to talk about okay. brands. Uh, so, so, and another lady, now I lost, uh, says that uh, her daughter is uh, celiac, but Italy was was great for her. So oh, good. very good. likely. Uh, and, you know, somebody saying chickpea flour right, or, you can, or yeah. let's, Cindy saying, let's go with the spaghetti squash. <laughs> 
not well, really the okay. same thing, but... uh, you know and, and i was i was going to suggest faro because faro uh, is far but there is a little gluten in faro but not a lot so faro yeah. would be an a, a, a yeah, yeah. Name for some people yeah. right 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 yeah Ah, e in corn, you know, there are a lot of suggestions. So, right. so celiac friends, you know, take notes about yeah. all the suggestions that are coming in from uh, from other attendees. Uh, Marcello Formaggi, gluten free, uh, among others. So, you know, th this is very interesting. Now, um, my last question for, for you, I guess, is uh, what, uh, you know, the book is coming out in, in the fall, the new book, yeah. and you're concentrating about, you know, particularly maybe vegetables. So we talked about gluten-free. How about ve vegetarian and vegans? How are you, I don't know, addressing uh, if I, you know, well, those... there, well, you know, there's so many vegetables in, in the book. So that's vegan uh, to begin with. But what I tried to do was use, uh, develop recipes that included everything from antipasto to dessert. So there's something for everybody in that book. And of course, because it's a vegetable book, we can uh, say that it's vegan. <laughs> yeah, no, but in part. fact, when I when I was thinking about the fact that, uh, that yeah. the, there are a lot of vegetables that have and probably yeah. this is good for vegans too, because nowadays yeah. there are quite a, quite right. many. Right. Uh, Denine is asking, when are you coming back to Buffalo? I wanted to see you the last yeah. time, but I had to go to a wedding. <laughs> yes, well, I was just in Buffalo in October. So um, I don't know when I'm coming back to Buffalo, but I was there in October. So we just have to check our website and, mm -hmm. you know, look at under the appearance pages. and Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. So if uh, our attendees don't have any more comments or questions, uh, you know, I, I would close the event. But of course, I want to thank Marianne, who is so much fun to have. You know, Marianne, come anytime. Let's do another, another part, part two in the future. Okay. Uh, and of course, if you want to come to the bookstore, that would be fabulous to have you in person maybe during the spring the summer when things are safe I'll come when my new book comes out How's yes that? good idea yeah. in the fall so that we can still open the 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 windows and air the place and, right. uh, and maybe we won't be in masks by then <laughs> you know i hope so yeah. i hope so but many people are thanking you you've been wonderful i would also like to thank again nayaf to supporting this this event and our next ones my friends we have a lot a lot a lot of wonderful events coming up so please check our website i'm going to write down here where you can find all our um events so just give me a second in the meantime you keep writing and here is the page with the events check it out because really uh we are doing a great great job in organizing more more meetings i apologize that i wasn't able to do this the slideshow i don't know why it didn't go through but thank you for your advices because uh next time if i have a powerpoint i will do a better slideshow and i'll practice in advance so apologies from me but thanks again a Marianna Marianne Esposito. I say Esposito in That's Italiano. Esposito, si, si, si. Because in Italian we say Esposito. In the States, I think they say Esposito. Yeah. But that sounds good too. <laughs> So, Marianne, thank you again. Grazie mille. Best of luck with your pro TV program, with the new book, with your traveling to Italy. You know, enjoy and enjoy the best food ever, the Italian food. Thank you so much for having me and for everyone who came to be part of the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ciao. Alla prossima volta. Arrivederci. Alla prossima volta. Ciao.